Good. Okay, so it's a great pleasure to introduce Alba Cervera Lierta, who has uh, graduated from Universitat uh, Barcelona, Barcelona, uh, in the particle physics group of Jose Ignacio La Torre, who, however, many of you know, uh, concentrates in the recent years on uh, quantum information very strongly. Uh, so she did the Master of Science and uh, PhD there. And then uh, she became a postdoctoral researcher in the at the University of Toronto in the group of Alan, Alan uh, Asporu Guzik, uh, which is, I understand, between the Department of Chemistry and uh, Computer Science. So the stage is here. Okay, now, yeah, thank you. Thanks much uh, for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to, to give this talk. Um, I work in quantum computing, not in machine learning, although I have some works in quantum machine learning that I will briefly introduce. And the idea of this talk is to give an overview of, uh, of what is the current state of the art in quantum computing, which, is, uh, we, which we are now at what is called the noise intermediate scale quantum era, NISC. And I will just explain a little bit of all this stuff. And I will assume that uh, no prior knowledge about quantum computing. So I will start with a brief summary of uh, what is quantum computation. And then I will move up uh, to what is the NISC era and what are the principal characteristics of it. Uh, then the main uh, group of algorithms in NISC are the variational quantum algorithms. So I will focus on, on that particular family of quantum algorithms. And then, uh, of course, there are a lot of limitations in current uh, in quantum computers, especially experimental limitations and also some theoretical ones. So that was uh, that's why I call this section squeezing the needs lemon, because there are many things that we can try to, to enhance the, the capabilities of current quantum computers. And I'm not sure how much time I will require for these parts, but then when, whenever I finish, we will make a break, and then I will come back with some well-known NISC algorithms and if we have some time, I can show you some tutorials that I prepare of some of these super famous uh, variational quantum algorithms. And if not, you can anyway check my tutorials in my GitHub account uh, and play with them. Okay, so what is the what is quantum computing and what is the basics of, of this technology? I, I'm sure that many of you know already how this works, but uh, let's just summarize a little bit what is a quantum computer. First of all, a uh, quantum computer, of course, is a device that uses the properties of, of quantum mechanics to, to, to uh, store information and to process this information. And some main characteristic is like its uh, software is classical. We control classically the, the quantum computer. And then the hardware is the quantum part, which is composed by qubits that are the basic units of quantum information, where all the information is stored and is processed there. And then in the end, it's a feedback loop. We send instructions. We uh, receive some result from this quantum computer, which is a classical string that we need to post-process or to interpret or depending on the algorithm. Then we will come back with another solution and so uh, another proposal and so on and so forth. But this is the, the main idea. It's a software that is classical and a quant uh, hardware that is quantum. And how does it work? Of course, the basic units are called qubits, which, here, which stands for quantum bits. And uh, in contrast to bits that are, which have only two very definite uh, states, zero and one, qubits can have a superposition according to the quantum mechanics. And this superposition is, is made by two orthogonal states, uh, which we will call zero and one, and uh, can have any parameter in front of them, which could be complex, of course, negative, and that's why they are called uh, amplitudes instead of probabilities. And then when we have more than, than one qubit, we, for instance, two qubits, then we, we can have a superposition state of all of, 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 all of them. And uh, we will need four numbers in this case to, uh, to describe this quantum state. And here is where you start seeing what, how the Hilbert space, which is where these uh, qubits live, starts to grow exponentially in comparison with the classical resources. So we will need two to the power of n uh, classical um, 
numbers, let's say, to describe a quantum state. And of course, another property that may, uh, may appear is the entanglement, which means that we cannot describe the, each part of these systems independently, but uh, we have a joint state. And because of that, there are many properties that, uh, that these quantum algorithms will take advantage of. I'm, I'm being super quick because I assume that some of you already know all this, all this theory, um, but please feel free to stop me at any point. So this, uh, this means that we have new, now a new paradigm in, in computation, which is quantum computing. That doesn't mean that quantum computation will replace classical computation at all. It's just another paradigm that we can explore uh, and we can use for particular uh, problems. But uh, in the same idea that we don't use a supercomputer to check our emails, we will not use a quantum computer for absolutely everything, only for those tasks that a classical computer is not suitable for, or it requires too much energy or any other thing that a quantum computer may be more powerful. But in these particular problems, not it, don't, not, it will not be the, the case in most of them. So in this, uh, in, with this paradigm, we have these quantum states, which are two dimensional systems in this case. And, and the, all the quantum gates, uh, quantum logic gates that we will use will be represented by Hermitian operators that fulfill and also follow all the quantum mechanical rules. And for instance, this example, which is the control node gate, uh, it, what it does is sums the X and Y uh, states of, of these qubits. And in a way you can think about it like four sums have been performed in parallel at the same time. Uh, just to be clear, it doesn't mean that quantum computing power, uh, power relies on the parallelization of all the operation. That's not what really happens in quantum algorithms. The main property that exploits quantum computation is the interference between the, the different uh, quantum states. So these alpha and betas can be negative numbers, can be complex numbers. Then when we apply another operation that is more sophisticated than a control node, it may lead to some cancellations. So in the end, the final state is not the full superposition state, but is some particular state which encodes the solution. But in the end, the idea is this, is this one, that with a single operation, we are affecting more than one state, or we may affect more than one state at the same time. And that's for a point of view of the energy, it's also a, it's an advantage. So something that will require four sums in this particular example, with classical resources, it only requires one operation. So even if quantum computing um, could or not could be a more powerful than a classical algorithm, uh, it can be more energy saving. So we can save some energy. And this is another advantage that uh, quantum computing scientists are trying to unravel. If it can also be efficient from an energy point of view, even though it's not more faster, uh, this particular algorithm for, in comparison with the classical ones. So just to be clear, some math, uh, one qubit state can be represented with uh, what is called a block sphere. And this representation only works for one qubit, but it's quite uh, interpretable. That's why I include it here. And, okay. I don't know why it does that here. So this block sphere represents the pure states in the surface of the sphere and the mixed states, those that cannot be written down in the standard uh, a state form inside of this block sphere. And this block sphere is the representation of the SU2 group, which are the qubits also are represented by, by this uh, special unitary group. And we can represent it in this form because it's isomorphic to the SU3, which is the group of rotations. And in the end, uh, why I say all these things? Because we can represent the evolution of a qubit as rotations around the block sphere. So for instance, if we want to rotate the qubit around the x-axis, we are performing a rotational x and it's represented by this operator. So in the end, we can evolve this qubit and move it around the block sphere by using the rotational formalism that we already know from, from classical physics. And that will be especially useful later on uh, in, in some of these quantum algorithms and especially to, to define all these quantum operations and, and basic gates. And experimentally, how can we interpret that? Because all of this is math. So in the end, why we didn't have a quantum computer many years ago when, when we already know all this math? So quantum computing field really ex exploded at the end of the 90s, beginning of the 2000s, because experimentally, we were able to build devices with these properties. 
So quantum information science has been around for many decades, but the problem was that we didn't have the technology to exploit it. But finally, at the end of the 90s, beginning 2000s, we already we started to control the individual quantum systems, for instance, starting with photons, but then with also uh, superconducting devices and other kinds of technologies like trapped ions. And these devices allow us to, to explore experimentally and to check the, what are the, the possibilities of this new technology. So in the end, this qubit should be a physical system that uh, obeys the laws of quantum mechanics and that has two very definite states, the zero and the one, that we will take and redefine as zero and one. So what can we use for that very schematically? We can think about an atom. So the ground state of this atom will be our zero state, and the, the first excited state that we can control will be the one state. Or we can also have an artificial atom, which are the superconducting circuits precisely, which basically is the, the same idea. We have an, an harmonic oscillator in, in terms of the energy spectrum of this, uh, of this circuit, and we can level the, the ground state energy as zero and the first energy uh, excited energy as one. But as you can see, and this is just a general comment, we have here more than one, two levels. We can have the two, we can have the three. In the end, we can have almost infinite levels. Uh, another very different thing is if we can control these levels, but they are technically there. So in this case, we have to take into account experimentally that these extra levels would add some noise into our, into our um, a computation. They will affect each time that we control these levels, we can uh, excite the zero state to the two state, for instance, and this will introduce some, some error noise. So in the end, experimentally, it's much more challenging to have this quantum computer, of course, that theoretically, because we have to deal with the real world, which have much more levels that has noise and the coherence. We also have a lot of noise that comes from the temperature that uh, surrounds our quantum computer, for instance. And that's why its technology have different um, challenges that we have to overcome eventually. But why we are doing all this effort of building a quantum computer if we have super uh, powerful supercomputers that uh, and powerful classical techniques that already allow us to, to perform different operations and simulations? So the reason in the end is quantum. We have things like molecules, which in the end are quantum. We have uh, proteins, which are quantum at the very end. We have uh, material sciences, which, the, which works because of, of the laws of quantum mechanics. We have many kinds of problems that we know that they are not solvable efficiently with a classical computer. And then in the end, we have a classical computer that could be one of these ones, very old ones. And even if... Uh, if we have a super uh, quantum computer like the one in, in that was in, in that in Barcelona supercomputing center, we can do very powerful things. But in the end, we cannot simulate quantum mechanics exactly. We cannot simulate the big systems because, as I said before, to simulate a quantum systems, you need an exponentially amount of resource of classical resources. And of course, you can just put together many Mare Nostrums one after the other and simulate bigger and bigger and bigger systems. But this will require a huge amount of power. And as an example, in the case of this Mare Nostrum, this is Mare Nostrum 4. They are now building Mare Nostrum 5, which is the next generation of, of this supercomputer. And they need to build a full power station in Barcelona to, uh, just to field of this supercomputer. Because it's, it, it requires a huge amount of energy. And of course, you can simulate very cool things, and it's uh, extremely useful for many tasks, but in the end, it's energy costly. And that's why in, in classical computation, it's not only moving towards making things smaller and smaller, but especially of making things energy saving, because it takes too much energy to, to run these circuits. And you can easily check that with your laptop. It's time that you have to run some uh, um, complicated simulation. It starts to to heat up and it's because of that. It requires a lot of energy to do these computations. So from this point of view, yes, we need a quantum computer for quantum simulation, obviously, or to explore problems that go beyond the, the classical complexity classes, but especially because at the very end, we cannot use a classical computer for absolutely everything. And another example is the very recently was uh, proof of quantum advantage in, in a, with, uh, with a quantum computer, with the Google quantum computer. And also with a, with a, with boson sampling in a in a Chinese group, and one of it was uh, famous on Twitter. One of the anecdotes explained by one of the referees of, of this second work, 
which says, uh, okay, well, you, you, have simul you have performed this task with your photonic quantum computer, and you have simulated this task up to 40 qubits, I think it was. Uh, why you don't go further? Because it seems that you have the, the classical simulator, it works pretty well. So why not you go until 70 or more? And they answer that they require $400,000 or so of computational time only to simulate these, these 40 qubits. So yeah, you can technically keep going, keep going, but at some point it will just require unfeasible. So this is precisely what I was saying, even in the quantum supremacy experiment from Google, they also prove how much time you will need to simulate this, uh, the, their system. And even though after this paper, the new classical papers emerged and said, well, we have another classical technique to do that more efficiently. Yes, maybe you can do that, but it's still, if I add another qubit, uh, the task will increase exponentially. So you will need much more resources again. So in the end, it's not a matter of if you can do it or not, it's if you can scale it or not. So even if you present to me a very clever classical technique that works almost efficiently and you can simulate 1000 qubits maybe, uh, it will not be enough if, you, if instead of 1000, I have 2000 qubits or 1001, because that, ex, uh, the Hilbert space explodes exponentially. That's uh, that's the minimum of an exponential in the end. And lastly of this section, uh, a little bit of not gossip, but just to explain who is building these devices in the end in the industry. Of course, all this field has been uh, developed in the universities and research center until they realized that that could be um, commercially available and uh, there could be some benefits from building a quantum computer and then it's when all the companies just uh, jump into the into this field and say okay we want to build the first quantum computer the first quantum computer that performs a quantum advantage experiment and that's faster of a classical computer etc and i'm sure that many of you have heard many uh, journal titles that uh, that claim that quantum computation will will uh, surpass classical computation, is exponentially faster, et cetera. Of course, not all of them are, are super um, um, technical, to be honest. But then uh, that's what is true is there is a lot of investment in quantum computing, especially because of what I said. They just realized that we can build these devices. It's something that is real, that we have them in our labs. And of course, there is a long road until we have quantum advantage, but still uh, we have the technology and we are exploiting it. So that's why all these companies are, are appearing. And most of them, if almost all of them, I would say, uh, come from universities. So in the end, there are people that were working on this field uh, or they were doing their masters or PhD in some of the top universities. And they just realized that, uh, okay, I can just build my startup and do what I was doing, but this time selling my devices for, for other companies. And that's why most of these companies are startups. For instance, Blue Force, Ku Control, and and Kilimanjaro, Shanadu, all of these uh, were startups at some point, and some of them are now, um, um, they earn many millions of dollars in investments to build these devices. And last part is where is it built? So as I said, there is a lot of investments. In Europe, we have the, the quantum flagship, so it was 1 billion euros for quantum technologies. Here I only talk about quantum computing, but there are other kinds of quantum technologies like quantum, uh, quantum simulation, quantum um, communication, including cryptography, and also quantum sensing. And these other technologies are working in the same direction. So some of them make more or less noise, but in the end, they use the properties of quantum mechanics to enhance sensors or communications or to explore uh, physics like quantum simulators. So with that, I close this very fast and introductory part of, of my talk. And now I will move to what is the state of the art in quantum computing. Is there any questions so far? OK.
thank you Alba for a super nice summary. I am wondering if you can give, you are like one of the leading experts in this field. So can you give your perspective on like, where is this going? You are showing all these companies and you are aware how the technology has scaled. Like, what do you believe will be the problem that quantum computers are going to solve first and when? Well, maybe this is a question for the end of my talk, <laughs> because I don't even really start with what is the state of the art and what are the problems and advantages of near-term quantum computation. But in my case, I will say that I have no idea, really, because um, there are many proposals, there are many things that we can try. And during this last year, so the thing has exploded so exponentially that things completely change from one year to another. So for instance, we published recently this review I um, mean, recently, 2021, and almost all the papers are from after 2018 or so, almost all of them. Of course, there are some foundational papers, but the, there are, I think, six, 600 references or so. Almost all of them are from the last five years or so. So many things have changed and many challenges are appearing that no one think about them before, especially in these near term. So quantum computing was much more advanced in what is called the fault tolerant uh, quantum computing uh, point of view, let's say, which is all this uh, theoretically perfect quantum computation and the most famous algorithms like rubber search, factorization algorithms, all these algorithms are require a perfect quantum computer and we don't have that. So that's why uh, the field was more or was quite advanced and there are many words in that direction, but in near term, it's not clear what is feasible and what is not. And I will talk about some of these challenges and of course, you have quantum chemistry, as I will explain later, and optimization problems, even quantum machine learning. But no one has proved experimentally, uh, not even theoretically, that, that there will be an advantage there. So we hope there is something, and especially in the, from an energy point of view, probably. But we don't know yet, because in the end, our quantum computers are still very small. So we cannot really benchmark what's going on. Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. So now we are in the in near term quantum computing, which is also called noisy intermediate scale quantum era. And this is a term that was coined by John Preskill in an article from 2018. So as you can see, only three years ago. So it's a very recent field, although it has been a lot of development in the last uh, 10 years, I will say, especially with the appearance of quantum computers and quantum computers on the cloud. So probably most of you have used one of the IBM's computers, which can be accessed freely in the cloud, some of them, the smaller ones, and has allowed many people to explore quantum computing field, even though you maybe you don't have prior knowledge about quantum computing. So it's a field that is expanding and, and there are many things to try and many words already uh, around. So as I said before, the power of quantum goes beyond quantum simulation. So of course we have quantum systems and we want to understand what are the physical properties of these systems. And of the logical step will be to build a device that obeys the say laws, the laws of quantum mechanics. And that was the approach that Feynman uh, proposed in the eighties of why, uh, why not building a device that uh, follows these rules to study what's going on there. But then there are other things besides quantum uh, simulation, which is all these problems that are not inside the classical complexity classes. So these classes, we have the what we said uh, what we say easy problems that belong to class P, which means that they are efficiently uh, computed with a classical computer. So, for instance, matrix multiplications. These are P problems. But then there are other kinds of problems that are extremely hard, like NP problems or or more which requires a lot of time for a classical computer. They are not efficient, but if I give you the solution, you can check easily what is that. And for instance, although it's not well known where is integer factorization, it is around this class NP because uh, integer factorization, if I ask you what are the, the factorization of a given number, it will require you a lot of time to obtain that. But once I give you two numbers, you can easily multiply them and check if my solution was correct. So this was a kind of a, a NP problem. And then something like happens in the, in the 90s that, that uh, so, uh, physicist Peter Shore, he found a quantum algorithm that can factorize numbers efficiently. So because of that, the people started to realize that, wait, if we have a quantum computer, which uses a different rules like as classical computer, like uh, in, in contrast to classical computation, 
maybe we can start exploring all these problems that doesn't belong to the P class. And maybe defining a lot of new uh, complexity classes like BQP, which are the efficient problems for quantum computers. So it's not clear uh, the, all this classification into different complexity classes. This is a huge field in complexity theory. Uh, but what is clear is that quantum computing uh, um, expands some of these classes and creates new ones. So another field that uh, another thing that someone can explore there, if you're interested in, in this more theoretical part of, of quantum computing, is defining these classes and classifying the problems into these classes, which is not an easy task, but it's also important to see what are the limits of quantum computers. So as you can see, below, beyond PQP, there are some classes and no, that not even quantum computers can solve efficiently. So quantum computers will not solve all possible problems. They will just solve some extra problems that maybe classical computers can, and that's it. But there will al always exist problems that not even a quantum computer can solve. And uh, talking about the, exp uh, the exponential expansion of this field, uh, I found it very interesting to see these trends. So these are the emerging concepts in quantum physics in general. And as you can see, the most um, emerging concept was qubit, precisely, which, uh, by the way, was proposed for the first time. We were looking for it in April 95 in this paper about quantum coding. It's where qubit is mentioned for the first time. Although before that, of course, many people were talking about two-dimensional systems or, or, or quantum beads, etc. But the, the word qubit appeared for the first time in April 95. So this is the most emergent concept in quantum physics. And this is, uh, I, I was just uh, looking for some of my old read stall from, some, from 2018, so three years ago. And there were already all these, uh, all, all these advances. So as you can see from 2007, all these companies started to appear because people realized that you can build these quantum computers. And it's a kind of a race. So new, new companies are founded, new companies, they claim that they have a bigger quantum computer. So it's, we'll see who has the first quantum advantage experiment really. But as you can see, there is a lot of competition. And of course, I don't include here uh, all the university and research centers and not even uh, quantum other things beyond quantum computation, like quantum simulation, for instance. So there are other experiments with quantum simulators that although they are not universal computers, they can still uh, find very interesting properties in matter. And it's, uh, it's crazy how this field is, is evolving in, the, in a few years. So to focus a little bit more, uh, what are these quantum computing paradigms in general, not only in NISC, uh, also in general in all quantum computing. So we have different ways to use a quantum computer and to build this quantum computer. Some ways will be more suitable for particular technologies than others. So that's why there are all these different uh, proposals. But in the end, in my talk, I will just focus on the gate-based quantum computation, which is what you will think about when I mention computation, logic gates, definite states, etc. So it will focus on that. And uh, let me recap what are the basic properties in case that you are not familiar with, uh, with gate-based quantum computation. So we have the qubits, which are the two-level systems, as I said before. And uh, they are defined, all these quantum diagrams, each line corresponds to one qubit. And, uh, and then we have the gates, which will be represented with boxes in general, except some particular quantum gates that are represented, for instance, with the symbol uh, as the control node, which are these uh, Hermitian matrices, complex matrices. And experimentally, they will be laser pulses, microwave pulses, depending on the technology. And finally, we have the measurement, which is a very important part, of course, because in the end, we need to extract the information from our quantum computer. And for measurement, we need to couple our quantum system with, uh, with, with us somehow, but at the same time without perturbing uh, what is going on inside. So these are very difficult tasks in the end. And that's why uh, sometimes uh, measurements take a lot of time in our computation. So I'm not sure if some of you have seen the, the, the pulses in, in the Qiskit, uh, IBM Qiskit uh, framework. They publish uh, sometimes the, the, the pulse schedule, how much time it takes for each gate to be implemented in the quantum computer. And normally the measurement pulse is by far the one that takes more, uh, more time. So measurement will be very important also for post-processing. And if we don't measure properly, then our result will be affected by that. And we can just obtain a, a wrong point, for instance. 
And uh, to close this part, uh, I would want, I just want to show how different is the life when you run experiments in real quantum computers. So this is an example of the integral factorization, the Schur algorithm, super famous, very small and cute, and everything is very nice. The quantum Fourier transform at the end, and that's it. Well, let's take a look of a particular part. This part here requires all these gates, requires others, and these others will require carrier, what are called carriers. So in the end, each of these small gates require a huge amount of extra gates and probably extra qubits that we will use for, for extracting the, the values. And each of these others, as I said, they require carriers and control nodes, etc. And these carriers and others require uh, Toffoli gates, which in the end are decomposed into these Baji gates. So as you can see, the circuit, which was very small and simple theoretically, it becomes extremely complex and big uh, when we have to implement that in a real quantum computer. And the reason is that the, our quantum computers doesn't have these others. Our quantum computer have these control node gates, Hadamers, and no more than that. So far, there are, no, there are people that are trying to obtain a more than two qubit gates, but they are experimentally super complicated to obtain. So in the end, yes, we have a programmable quantum computer, but we cannot program everything that we want. We only can program particular gates, which means that we have to decompose everything into this particular gate set. And I wanted to show this uh, paper that I did uh, three years ago. So of course, many things have changed. Now the devices are better, but not much better, really. And it's this simple example, which is a very small circuit, four qubits only. This part here are represented by these gates, which is not a lot of gates, technically. So it's 35 gates of circuit depth. So technically, it should be enough to, to perform the, the experiment. But what happened? When I ran the experiment in both in the IBM and Brigetti machines, the result was far away from the expected one. And why is that? It's because we have many errors coming from not only the, the gates, but also the, the cross toll between the qubits. So it's time that we send a pulse, we affect another qubit, and so on and so forth. And these are really difficult to obtain. And that's why many people are working on, on all these noise models, how to mitigate the noise, etc. So in the end, even though you can design a quantum experiment that on the paper seems feasible, then you move to the experiment and it's extremely complicated and not so easy. And to compare NISC uh, versus other kinds of quantum computing, which are the origins of quantum computing, we use also the word fault tolerant, which is this perfect quantum computation. Uh, it will be eventually the future, we hope that. So our qubits will be perfect and we can perform whatever operation we want and require as many gates as we need. So this is a, a diagram that I obtained from, from this uh, article, which more or less illustrates what's the difference between NISC and fault tolerant. So we live in the classical world, and to go to NISC, we need first to cross all these burden planes of NISC, which means that at, at least we need to, uh, to hold some quantum uh, properties. For instance, the coherence time, so we need to keep the superposition states somehow. But then if we want to cross the, the error, correct, we need to cross the error correction uh, river to arrive to the fault tolerant fortress. And why we want to do that? So who lives in the fortress? In the fortress, as I said, live a uh, short algorithm and global search algorithm and other famous algorithms like quantum Fourier transform, et cetera, that they prove theoretically there is a quantum speed up in comparison with classical techniques. But then in the planes, we have other kinds of algorithms. We have the variational algorithms, for instance, and we have other kinds of, of quantum computing paradigms. So in the end, we need to do our best to exploit the resources that we have. So even though the, the houses in the fortress are made with logical qubits, which are error corrected, so they are perfect, the, um, the bricks in the, in the noisy, uh, in, in this uh, near-term quantum computation will be the noisy qubits. And we have to do our best to exploit this technology uh, with the current resources that we have. Uh, by the way, we need 1,000 noisy qubits per logical qubit. So you can imagine how far away are we from fault-tolerant quantum computing. So we will need billions of qubits to perform a short factorization algorithm, for instance. So it's time that you see any title like quantum computing will break encryption, whatever. You require billions of qubits to do that. And we have devices of 100 as much or even less. 
so you can see how far away are for, for that goal. Any questions so far about? Yeah, so you mentioned uh, a thousand uh, qubits per logical qubit, and has this been improved? Because these results are like uh, beginning of 2000 now, so. There are some quantum error correcting codes that require much less qubits, but it's, it's still they cannot correct all possible uh, noise. So it depends on what do you want to correct or what you need to correct. So, I mean, the 1000, that's why it's, a, of course, a big, a very approximate uh, a number, there are some quantum error correcting codes that they require 100 or even less, depending on which kind of noise you want to correct. If you only want to correct the noise of one qubit, then you need much less. I think the record is seven qubits or nine qubits. But if you want to correct things that are much bigger, like two qubit gates or carrier gates, like the ones from Shure algorithm, you will require much more. And it also depends on how many, uh, what is your error threshold. So it doesn't, it's not the same if your qubit is super noisy or just slightly noisy. So that will also change. Is that you would like to have that the error does not depend on the number of times you apply the gates. And this is not the case. Usually the more times you apply, the it grows uh, in, not in a linear manner. Exactly. So dealing with noise is extremely complicated. Although, of course, there is all this other field in quantum computer, which basically propose different error correcting codes that are resistant to different kinds of noise and can correct more, more ki kinds of noises. Uh, but correct me if I'm wrong, but are the different kind of noises on a different uh, scale? So meaning that there will always be a dominating error that you are willing to correct. And this should in principle make you make your life easier, right? Well, I will say I'm not an expert in uh, noise models, but the problem here is that there are many sources of errors that will change different things of your quantum computer. So you can have errors that relax your qubit from the one state to the zero state and you can compensate that. Mm -hmm. But then you will have other kinds of, of noises that will decoherence completely your state. And even though some of them are more important than others, once you correct ones, you still need to correct the others to perform these perfect algorithms. So in the end, of course, if you can deal with one particular error, you will improve significantly your, the performance of your algorithm, but still you will have other error sources. And all of them are more, uh, most of them are uh, correlated. So if you can not only correct one, you need to also deal with the other sources of error. And some of them are comes from hardware. So the problem of these errors is some of them comes from, from the programmability, let's say, of your computer. So you can deal with your pulses in a particular manner to compensate the errors. But others comes from hardware. You will always have errors for sure in your hardware. So the, the device is not perfect. And dealing with the, those is much more complicated in general because it means that you have to improve the, the fabrication. So even if there is one that is relevant, you will just still need to, to deal with all of them. Hi. In order to gain some perspective on, on this ratio of noisy qubits to logical qubits, I was wondering if we could look at the beginnings of classical computation and the beginnings of classical error correction. I don't know if you have some numbers or of what was the ratio of uh, actual bits to logical bits at the beginning to get an idea of how much we can improve. Also, what is the ratio today? I have no <laughs> idea. As far as I know, it's not, so bits are so precise that you don't need error correction at all. Okay. So and that's, as far as I know, that's the thing. So. At some point, I think that at the, I'm not I'm not sure, but I think at the beginning of classical computation, they were also also dealing with these errors. But in the end, the errors with bits is what do you assume it's a zero when you assume it's a one? You can define a threshold quite easily because you only have to define the states. You don't have superpositions of them. And then that was complicated uh, with the initial the first transistors. But then the technology was so good that they don't have to deal with errors anymore. And I think that they probably made the repetition code, which is the simpler one. So instead of codifying the zero into one zero, you have zero, zero, zero. And if you have some error, instead of zero, you will have one and you can easily correct that. With quantum computation, you can also have errors of this kind or you, can, or you have phase errors. Like instead of 
um, 0 0.1, 0 0 0, you have 0 0.2. So that's much more different, difficult to, to correct than with the repetition code. So as far as I know, it's not used in classical computation because it's not necessary. It's, they are too good for that. So hopefully we will arrive to that. I don't think that would be the case in quantum because as I said, the errors are much more sophisticated than the classical ones. I understand this subtlety. So then I guess a follow-up question would be if there is a theoretical lower bound on the number of um, actual qubits that we will always require to have one logical qubit. Yeah, yeah, there are some quantum error correcting codes for correcting one qubit fully. I mean, any operation in only one qubit, I think you need seven or nine extra qubits to encode the, the quantum information. And I think that's proof of theoretically, like you cannot go further than that. But this is only for single qubit gates. If you have two qubit gates, things change completely. Okay. So, so yeah, uh, I think there are some, uh, some lower bounds and that's what people are working on, but still you require to multiply your number of qubits by uh, by some number, not exponentially, but the prefactor will be important. Thank you. Especially now that we only have few qubits, so it's it's difficult to. So even if we only have to imagine that we need a quantum error correcting code that requires two qubit for each to to represent each logical qubit. So for fifty qubit uh, devices, we will need one hundred or for 100, we would need 200. So if we don't solve the problem of scalability, it's impossible to even think about quantum error, experimental quantum error correction. Okay, so what can we do uh, assuming that we will have these errors? So we are not correcting the errors. We assume that our quantum computer is imperfect. So uh, we cannot run, as I said, these uh, super famous algorithms and circuits that require many gates, because at some point we lose the coherence. So we need to keep the superposition of the states and interference and entanglement, etc. So if our circuit is super long, at some point we will lose this coherence and the circuit will collapse to a particular state and our quantum algorithm is, done, is gone. So instead of having uh, this kind of circuits that require this particular control node gate, this particular Hadamard gate, and so on and so forth, we can think about variational circuits. So we can think about um, our quantum computer as a variational machine that proposes different kind of, uh, of, uh, of quantum states. And that depends on a series of parameters that we have to fine tune. So in the end, we generate some quantum state that will not be the solution of our problem, but then we have some way to change and fine tune the parameters of our quantum circuit to find the, the solution of the problem. And that's the main idea of, the, of these variational quantum algorithms that I will explain in the next se session. So the question is if we can design these kind of algorithms and how. But the main point is we don't require any more uh, perfect rotational X gate over pi over two um, angle. We just require that some loss function that we will use at the very end of the circuit finds what are the particular parameters that uh, that work for our circuit. And of course, this, this will depend on the experimental uh, device. So maybe for this device, we will need these angles. Maybe for this other device, we will need another one. The point here is that we can always fine tune that. And as long as we maintain the coherence, we eventually will find a solution. There is a question there. Is it possible that those parameters uh, would be also problem dependent? Or is it, is it um, guaranteed that once you fix them for a certain device um, um, and maybe a certain algorithm, then they will be input independent? Because if they are input dependent, then I don't see why this, how, how this could be uh, done. <laughs> by I don't understand. By input dependent, what do you so mean? That, uh, so that for a certain device and a certain algorithm, you you want to feed the, the algorithm with different possible inputs. Mm -hmm. So is it guaranteed that optimizing those parameters um, um, on, a certain, um, on a certain input uh, um, will, will give you the parameters that will be fixed for all for and, and um, uh, efficient for all other possible 
inputs uh, algorithm. that's one of the depending on what is your, your goal but i see where where are you going into quantum machine learning uh, like uh, applications like a neural network that you train and then you use the same parameters for for later on. i don't know if you are thinking about this because i will talk about this later but it depends on your problem the it will depend on your hardware for sure so that you cannot overcome that so eventually if you run your the same circuit in different hardware then you need to optimize again of course there are many things that you can try to do to, to do like i can first classically obtain the parameters or part of it, or some approximation of them and then i use the quantum computer at the very end to fine tune the the final solution so i expect that uh, different quantum computers will have similar parameters although not exactly the same so you can just run a small optimization there so it depends on what is your goal and it depends on the particular algorithm but in the end it's the only thing that you can do so far if you don't have quantum error correction because the gates will depend on the hardware in the end and the noise that you have at, the, at that particular uh, point of the day even because it changes during the day also so that's uh, the problem of dealing with imperfect uh, devices So in the end, it's a clever way to explore the Hilbert space that is exponentially big, as I said uh, many times. And we, we will start from some initial state, which is some state that we can compute with our, with, that we can prepare easily with our quantum computer. And we want to reach some solution and maybe we have some super perfect algorithm that do that, but we cannot implement that experimentally. So we have to deal with it somehow and find another way, another path in our Hilbert space. And in this particular variational quantum algorithms, this path will be variational. And this, uh, I'm closing this section now. So the noise intermediate the scale quantum computation era, this is the definition. So we have, it's hard because qubits have to interact strongly, but at the same time, not too much because we have to, we have to keep the coherence and but and we have to measure them so they cannot be completely protected against uh, perturbation because we have to access the solution somehow and uh, the state of the art is we have devices of the order of 50 qubits some of them are 54 70 there were some devices but they they break down so they have to build again another one and it was of 54 qubits so that's the best thing that we can that we have the error gates are the order of 10 to the 3 minus 3 10 to the minus 4 or so and uh, there is no quantum error correction so these are this is the definition of noise intermediate scale error error is, uh, is small enough to perform at least some quantum algorithm we have the order of 100 qubits and there is no error, quantum error correction so what can we do in this uh, that's the big question, uh, as uh, as they were asking before. We don't know exactly yet if NIST will be uh, will carry any quantum advantage. Uh, but what can we do? Of course, is is a good trial field for the study physics, because we have now these experimental devices. Now we are dealing with quantum matter in a different way, and we are exploring what are the physics of this matter. So even though we are not building the, or even though if our goal is not to build a quantum computer itself. We are learning a lot of things about quantum technology. Uh, so only the path is uh, extremely interesting from a physical point of view. And maybe, hopefully, we have some applications here. And that's why all people like me are working on, like, OK, what are the quantum algorithms that we can run in these devices? And let's see if we can obtain some advantage eventually. Of course, you can, you can propose several theoretical algorithms that then they are not feasible to implement in real hardware or you think they are feasible, but then you go to the experiment and the results are a disaster. So that happens, but that's the problem of dealing with imperfect devices or to really face the experimental challenges. So what is interesting to me in this field is that people like me that are theoreticians, we, I'm not an experimentalist, we have to learn about the experiment. We need to know what are the, the limitations of the hardware, what are the gates that we can apply, how many gates uh, support our quantum computer, etc to try, try to extract the, the most of it of, of the near-term quantum computers in the end. So this will be basically the, the summary of what is noise intermediate scale era. So it's a little bit of, of all the imperfections that we have to deal with and eventually finding some ap uh, intricate applications that, uh, that, uh, that allow us to, to extract some, uh, some quantum advantage. 
So that's the best that we can do at the moment because we don't have quantum error corrections. So all these big theorems from the 80s, etc., they were not useful for us in this particular con con context. Okay, any questions about this general overview of what is missed? How much time did I spend in, in this first part? How many, sorry? Around 50. 50. 50. Oh, so maybe we should uh, stop here for 50 minutes and yeah. And I will come back with traditional quantum algorithms. We meet at uh, seven minutes after four. <laughs>
Thank you. So we start. Okay. <laughs> so we were here in variational quantum algorithms, which are one of them, if not the main representative of this uh, NIST-CARA. The parents of variational quantum algorithms are the variational quantum eigensolver and the quantum approximate optimization algorithm, QAOA. And of course, there are many other kinds of algorithms that I don't have time to, to run through them. And I actually have to cut some of these parts, so I don't think I will have time to explain QAOA. So I will anyway update my slides and, and we can talk about it the rest of, of the days. I will be around also tomorrow. So let's start with what are the variational quantum algorithms? What is the big picture? So they are based on the variational principle, which states that the, um, each time that we obtain, a, that we compute an expectation value of a particular state, that will be an upper bound of the ground state of, of that operator. And as I said before, we have now um, this uh, variational machine, which uh, is our quantum computer that will propose different quantum states and we will need to compute the, the expectation value of a particular operator with them. So we start with some initial state that is easy to prepare in our quantum computer, which means that we can initialize our quantum computer very quick uh, with this particular state. Normally it's the 0, 0, 0 state is uh, the, the, the main example. Then we have some quantum circuit that we will treat as a black box at the moment, which is uh, this variational machine that depends on, uh, on a series of parameters. For instance, the rotation, the, uh, the angles of a rotational gate or the parameters of a particular quantum gate. So in the end, there are some parameters that we can control and we can decide. And these are the, what depend on this particular quantum circuit. So after we apply the, this set of parameters, we have some output state that will be uh, at the beginning, uh, in general, will be a random state. With this output state, we compute the expectation value of some objective function. This objective function will be the, the, the Hamiltonian of our molecule in the case of the variational quantum eigensolver, or could be any kind of cost function that, can, in the, that is written in an operational form. So it can be anything that we decide. And that's the thing that will depend on the particular application of these variational quantum algorithms. So with that, we, we have some expectation value. And what, what can we do with that? we use this expectation value as our loss function that we will optimize and minimize using a classical subroutine. So this classical subroutine will find a new set of parameters that will be proposed. So we start the loop again, and we change this time the parameters of our quantum circuit and start all over again. So we will obtain another expectation value that will hopefully will be uh, lower and we repeat the process over and over until eventually we converge to some approximation of the ground state. Uh, these algorithms are also called hybrid quantum classical algorithms because this part here is classical. So it's a classical optimization. We are enhancing our quantum computer with a classical subroutine. So this classical subroutine will be, for instance, one of the well-known uh, opti classical optimizers, an Adam optimizer, for instance, a gradient, a gradient descent one, that will propose a new set of parameters. And by repeating the process over and over, eventually we hope to converge to an approximation of the ground state. Okay? Is that picture, general picture understood? Any question? Yeah. Then I will move later on to particular examples but, uh, of, of applications of that. Um, how exactly is the minimization done? Like you cannot really take gradients with respect to the parameters, right? Okay, I will, I will go through okay. it uh, not right now. So let's take a closer look to all these, uh, all these parts. So we'll start with the parameterized quantum circuit, sorry, but sorry, then- Sorry, there is one sorry. more question. It's related, so maybe you'll come to this, but uh, has progress been made on the vanishing gradients uh, problem? I will go through it later. <laughs> but the answer is not exactly <laughs> the short answer. So first, let's start with this uh, black blue box, uh, which is the parameterized quantum circuit. So this is the thing that we, want, that we are computing. It's some minimum over these parameters of an expectation value 
or where this, uh, where this quantum state depend on a series of parameters theta. So this, uh, this variational um, state will be the unitary state, which is our parameterized quantum circuit applied to the initial state, which in general is the zero state. It could be any other state, but in general, it will be the zero state. So first of all, I want to make clear there are some assumptions here. The first is that there exists this set of parameters. So what could happen? That when we construct this parameterized quantum circuit, maybe we are not designing it properly. So it's completely impossible to arrive to the ground state. So we will assume that our parameterized quantum circuit is good enough that it will find some approximation of this ground state. But we have to keep that in mind. If we are not representing a completely general unitary gate, then we can get trapped in some area of the Hilbert space and never reach the, the minimum. And then this parameterized quantum circuit can represent this solution, which is basically the same assumption. And we are not, we hope that we converge and we are not trapped in local minima. Of course, we will get trapped in local minima as any other optimization problem. And that's something that I will talk about later. And uh, this parameterized quantum circuit can be applied in a noisy computer. So in the end, if I give you a parameterized quantum circuit that requires uh, 1 million of gates, that this is not feasible in, real, in, in current state-of-the-art quantum computers. For that, we will use a fault-tolerant quantum computer where we can apply, for instance, Hamiltonian simulation techniques like uh, time evolution, et cetera, that we can trotterize the, the gates and that's it. So in the end, we need something that is feasible. So it's, it, it's not, uh, it doesn't have any sense to propose a circuit that is uh, enormous. How can we design? There are two, way, two big ways to design this parameterized quantum circuit. The first one is the problem inspired one, which is uh, we approximate, so we, we know which kind of uh, unitary we need, and we need to decompose it and approximate it using the gates that are available for us. And uh, this is, uh, this kind of uh, ansatz are called, uh, one of the main example is the one using quantum chemistry, which is the unitary coupled cluster ansatz that I will mention later. But the problem of these ansatz on one side, they obtain a good approximation of the solution because we construct that in this way. But on the other hand, they in general require a lot of gates. So they are in general not feasible in, uh, in current quantum computers. And the other way to, do, to, to design the ANSAT is the hardware efficient one, which is, okay, what are the gates that we have? Rotational gates and control node gates. What is the connectivity of our qubits, uh, this particular one? I will design a layer and the, I will repeat this layer over and over and cross fingers that, that will be expressible enough to find the ground state or an approximation of the ground state. So it's completely heuristic, although there are some techniques to to, to guide you and to approximate better this answer. But in the end, it's heuristic. There is no guarantees that you will find the ground state. But on the other hand, you can apply that in real quantum computer because you are designing the circuit in that way. So it's, this is one of the examples of this hardware efficient. So as you see, we define layers of gates, the, for instance, layer of rotational gates, layer of alternating control node gates, and we repeat over and over. We hope that by repeating multiple layers, we are approximating the solution better, but there is no guarantees in general. So it's heuristic. Then the other part is the objective function. And the main point here is that uh, we have some uh, operator, which could be a Hamiltonian or could be anything that can be encoded into a Hamiltonian form. And in the end, we cannot uh, um, compute the measurement or measure the Hamiltonian itself. We need, we need to decompose it into Pauli strings which are these uh, sigma matrices, which, can, which we can measure in our quantum computer following these kind of rules. So I have no time to go through it in detail, but in the end, uh, we compute expectation value of particular operators, which are these Pauli strings. And with the so the, the steps is, are, we have a Hamiltonian with a composite into Pauli strings, and we measure these Pauli strings. And after that, we classically, we post-process that and sum all together following the, the, the Hamiltonian form. So in the end, the expectation value that we measure in the quantum computer are these Pauli strings and not directly the Hamiltonian or the cost function that we design. And finally, following the question that, uh, that was asked before, how can we compute the gradients? So we don't necessarily need gradients. So there are other techniques that people are investigating to train these, uh, these parameters. Some people are even using neural networks, classical neural networks to 
to find these, these uh, variational parameters. But uh, there are many, many techniques to compute the gradients. In the end, you don't have the, grid, the exact gradient of your quantum state that will not be possible because it's a quantum state. But you compute the expectation value of these gradients. And there are uh, formulas like this parameter shift rule, which is a very simple rule that is not used in general because it's still costly, but there are other ways to improve this rule, this rule for, further. But the idea is that you know exactly the, the gates that you are using and you can um, the, you, you can define what are the expectation value that you need to reconstruct the gradient of that particular circuit. So in the end, what, kind, what things do you have to measure? You have to measure the expectation value of your circuit with the different Pauli strings that all together form the Hamiltonian that you want to minimize. And then you also have to measure all the gradients. So it's not only measuring the expectation value of your operator, you also have to measure the expectation value of all the gradients that you will use later in your classical subroutine. So as you can see, there are many measurements here. And that's one of the main problems of variational quantum algorithms. So it's a very clever technique, apparently, to, to take advantage of the, of, the NISC of, of the NISC computers. But on the other side, it, it's, it's quite expensive in, uh, in the measurement part, especially if we have more, uh, more variables. So it's a trade-off of how many measurements can you obtain, if it's feasible or not. You also need to, to repeat the classical uh, quantum loop um, multiple times, which means that you need to connect your quantum computer with your classical one very well. And that's why even if you try to, if you try to, to, uh, to run a very simple BQE, for instance, in an IBM quantum computer, you will see very quickly that it requires a lot of time and a lot of jobs to obtain a simple solution. And it's because this classical quantum feedback loop has to be re uh, performed in a very clever way. And very recently, they are uh, releasing other ways to do that uh, more efficiently, but it's also some work in progress. Did I answer your question? So, oh, sorry, there's another question here. Um, so you were talking about this problem of measurements and at the bottom of the, of the slide, you had generic algorithms and reinforcement learning, which are gradient free. Um, could you comment on whether these are better in terms of reducing the amount of measurements or other whether there are other optimizers well in the in the case of genetic algorithms for instance you don't need to compute the gradient so you are avoiding the computing all these ex extra expectation value to obtain the gradients but the still genetic algorithms at least the ones that i know uh, you will need to represent huge families of, of parameters so it's you need to perform a lot of, me of measures of the expectation value in order to to find the path towards the solution. So in the end, it's costly from another side. So it's not clear what is the best technique. So that's why many people are publishing different kind of techniques, benchmarking them. It will depend on your problem, if you have many variables, if not, if, you, if they are resistant to noise, if not. So there are many things to take into account. So. OK, thank you. I just wanted to mention that because in general, we always talk about gradient-based methods, but there are other ways to optimize and it's a, an open problem to find the best way. So if you're interested on that, it, there is a lot of, of room for improvements. So, okay, we have our variational quantum algorithm in general, but what are the challenges that it faces? And not only experimental ones. As I said before, one thing is the theoretical circuit. The other thing is what we have in the real quantum computer. So I will just mention a few of them. The first one is the, the quantum error mitigation techniques. So even we know that our computer is noisy. Can we do something to improve the results that we are measuring? And these are the sets of, of quantum error mitigation techniques, which uh, I personally divide in two sides, the classical post-processing ones and the real, the, let's say, mitigation techniques that happen in the quantum computer during the computation. The first part, what they do is, uh, we, let's estimate what will be the result if our computer was perfect and not noisy. And how can we do that? So we run the circuit once. Imagine that we have the final solution. We run the circuit. That will give us some, ground, some approximation of some ground state energy. 
Now let's introduce noise on purpose. So let's introduce some quantum gate and the, the conjugate of this gate. So in total, it's technically an identity. But since our circuit is noisy, that will not be an exact identity. That will uh, introduce some noise. So let's repeat this process over and over and measure what is the expectation value. In the end, we will see that this expectation value changes and it's uh, worse as we introduce more and more gates because we're, we are introducing more, more noise. So what zero noise extrapolation does is to extrapolate backward what will be the result if we didn't have noise at all. So we have some kind of curve where the first point was our original algorithm, uh, circuit, sorry, and then the next one will be one with uh, some noise, with more noise, with more noise, and we can extrapolate back. And then there are other techniques like the stabilizer-based approach that uh, what they try to do is to check other properties of, of the final state. For instance, if we are expecting an state with a particular parity, let's say, we can measure what is this parity of the state and know, and, and then we can know if that state was the ground state or not, or if it fulfilled the properties that we wanted. So in the end, all these techniques are, are post-processing part. So after we run the circuit, we do our best to obtain what will be the result uh, if our computer was perfect and not noisy. But then we have some active error mitigation techniques. For instance, the, uh, the optimal quantum control uh, strategies or dynamical decoupling. So in the end, is you need to, to learn more about the hardware for implementing these techniques. So what you do is to engineer the pulses that you use on your device to compensate the noise. So you are not error correcting the qubit. So the qubit will still be uh, imperfect. But you can send pulses in a way that the, they are applied in a better way than just the raw pulse. For instance, there are some techniques that are called drag. What, uh, what they do is to uh, prevent that, the, that you excite the qubit to the second, third, and fourth levels that you don't want. So these kind of uh, control strategies are also very useful because you are actually doing something in your quantum device. So it's not classical post-processing you are actually improving the, the hardware uh, or the engineering of your pulses. And of course, uh, these are directly related with the experiment, while the other ones, you don't really need to know many details about the experiment, just introduce noise manually. But then besides all the, the experimental challenges, we also have some theoretical ones as, uh, as we, they were mentioned before. And the main one is the barren plateau problem. So this variational algorithm has to start somewhere. So if we don't know what, uh, what is the solution or any approximation of the solution, we will start at random. And if we start at random, what happens is it was uh, mathematically proved that we have barren plateaus, which means that the gradients and the variances uh, tend to zero exponentially with the number of qubits or are exactly zero if we have uh, uh, no variables. So that means that our um, um, parameter space is flat we cannot explore anything. So that's a big problem because this is a theoretical problem. So it doesn't matter how good is our optimizer, the space is flat. So how, what can we do for that? So there are some solutions. For instance, use uh, parameters. Of course, if we use parameters close to the solution, we will converge to the solution, but that's not in general the case. But we can use local cost functions instead of global ones. This is an article that was published this year, but the preprint is from two years ago, so it's uh, already well known. And we can also introduce correlation between the, the different parameters of our quantum circuit. So there are many techniques that people are trying to, to benchmark and study theoretically if they can overcome this barren plateau problem. But it's something that you should keep in mind. The more parameters you have, the more likely and more qubits you have, more likely that you get trapped in not even a local minima, the, the space is completely flat. And this is because the Hilbert space is exponentially big. So it's really difficult to explore it. Um, following the question that before, um, as far as I know, there are no more advances than, than this new thing. I mean, not, I will not call it new because it's from two years ago, but it, they are actually new. So there's still a lot of, of room for, for this part. Also, there are other sources of barren plateaus, for instance, noise. Too much entanglement is also bad for, uh, for that. So it's complicated. It depends on the problem also. It depends on the parameterized quantum circuit that you're using, so. Uh, how does the flatness of your 
parameter landscape scales with respect to the number of qubits that you have, but also the amount of parameters that you have in your circuit. Because I would expect that if you overparameterize your circuit, then it's much easier to incur in such a problem. But if you overparameterize, then you have to compute a huge number of gradients also. So you have to keep that in account. So the more parameters you have, the more gradients you have to use if you use a gradient based approach. But anyway, it scales exponentially with the number of qubits. Mm -hmm. But in the case of gradients, if you really if you truly initialize at random, it's zero exactly. So the you can compute that the, the unitary is exactly zero. If you only have a few parameters, then I mean it's kind of easy. The optimizers just, just explore absolutely all the space and that's it. But if you have a reasonable number of parameters, which will be the, 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 real, the real problem in the end, you cannot explore the full, uh, the full space and the gradients are exactly zero and the variances tend to zero exponentially. So if you have small qubits, it's okay. You can still use second order techniques, mm -hmm. but if you have many qubits, you are completely trapped in this minima. And what's the order of magnitude for these parameters? It's like more or less an estimate, what like a, a reasonable number of parameters. Or you can still do. Mm, I I don't know. I would say I mean the typical simulations of these variational circuits without using any extra techniques take twenty parameters, maybe thirty. Okay. Forty. You Actually, will still you will start seeing these barren plateaus at some point. Okay. But in general, most of the words doesn't really look at the parent plateaus you just run the simulation and you obtain something close to the ground state and you are happy with that yeah, yeah, yeah but you can be just lucky in this sense or just that you're so there are many uh, equivalent solutions so the point of these algorithms is that you don't really have the ground state you have some approximation to the ground state so since you don't care about the particular ground state maybe you just found another solution that has a similar energy and you are happy with that so it depends on what do you want and which kind of problem do you have and what is your cost function. So some quantum machine learning uh, cost functions are uh, local instead of global. So you are only measuring a few subset of qubits and not all of them, and you can avoid barren plateaus there. Or there is correlation between different parameters. So you can also avoid barren plateaus in that way. So that's why some quantum neural network techniques, they, uh, they avoid barren plateaus, or at least that's the last works set. But what the last word said. Okay, and just a quick follow-up question. The goal of, of this uh, of these kind of experiments in your case is to focus on the minimization of the ground state energy or rather to uh, maximize the fidelity? Because as you just pointed out that these are relies on two different uh, levels, right? Because you can have a very good approximation of your ground state energy, but have a very bad fidelity depending on the your problem so it's not the ground state so i'm sorry i keep repeating ground state sometimes but what i mean is any for any function that can be encoded into a hamiltonian or operational form so for bq is the is the is the hamiltonian so you are minimizing the ground state but for other kind of problems like the quantum machine learning ones you have some loss function that you can encode into a into a hamiltonian form for instance the fidelity with respect to target state and you are minimizing that. So in the end, it's something that you can measure at the very end of your, of your circuit, and you are optimizing this thing to minimize it. We're using this variational principle anyway. Okay, thank you. I will show explicit examples later. Um, two more questions. So, um, is this why you say that um, the finding the ground state falls into the complexity class of uh, quantum complete problems? That's one. And the second is, um, uh, how does that work in case of, uh, well, near the uh, critical points of phase transitions, like just closing the gap, uh, cause any difficulty with this? Well, in general, finding the ground state of, uh, of any Hamiltonian is MP complete, I think, MP for sure. So the point here of the quantum computer is, can you obtain a good approximation in a reasonable time or better than a classical computer? And, and that's it. Of course, exactly for any kind of Hamiltonian, you will not solve the problem. It isn't B, and as, as far as I know, it has not been, I, sorry, for quantum Hamiltonian, it's not even NP, it's QMA, I think. So it's, it cannot be solved with, with a quantum computer in a reasonable time. 
but the problem of this kind of problems is on average, maybe they are not so difficult. So it's in general difficult, but you don't you don't ever know if a particular example is good. And in the end, you're looking for an approximation. So it's the best that you can do with your quantum computer. And if that is better than the, using the classical one, that's the, the big question in the end. So and re, in regarding the quantum phase transitions, well, that's something that if I have time, I will mention later. If it was one of my last works, we were analyzing the as a benchmark only of a general variational algorithm. What happens with the Heisenberg with the XX model? And you close the phase transition, and when you close the phase transition, the solution is much worse because in the end, the ground state is changing uh, drastically there. So as far as I know, in general, for BQ, it shouldn't be a problem if you are only measuring this particular um, energy. If you want to study all the energy landscape, then it could be a problem. So you need to take that into account into how you define your parameterized quantum circuit. But in Hamilton, in Hamiltonians related with chemistry, you don't have this quantum phase transition in general. So it's not a big problem, that thing. And so if you use local cost functions, will that not uh, work very badly for, let's say, strongly correlated systems or? Uh... I think so, but. Thanks. So that's why people are just proposing different ways to, to deal with that. It depends on the on the problem that you are addressing. In the end, we are still in the big picture of what is operational algorithm. Then we will move to particular examples which have their, their own uh, uh, problems and, and advantages. Okay, very quickly, the expressibility means uh, if we use a hardware efficient parameterized quantum circuit, so heuristically I define a circuit ansatz and, and see how it works. What could happen is that it's not expressible enough. So you cannot reproduce, not even get closer to the solution, even though if you don't have any barren plateaus at all. So what could happen? Your, uh, your parameter space in the end, your Hilbert space is exponentially big. Imagine that your solution is in a particular location and your parameterized quantum circuit is in a completely different one. So you can never reach that, uh, that solution, not, no matter how hard you try. So in the end, defining an expressible parameterized quantum circuit, so something that each time that I change one parameter, I can explore a huge part of the Hilbert space, or at least the one that I want to explore. It's also an important thing. And there are some measures of, mer uh, some figures of merit to quantify that, like, like this measure here. But it's also an open problem to find what are the best parameterized quantum circuits. And finally, in this part, circuit compilation. So I have no time to go through all the details, but in the end, we have good and bad news. Good news is that we have uh, well-known theorems like the solov aikitaev theorem and the gottesman nil theorem, which means that we can represent technically any unitary transformation using a, a universal gate set. So using only single qubit gates and two qubit gates, we can do whatever we want. Another very different question is that you can find this circuit and how can you find this circuit? These are only existence theorems that, yeah, it's technically possible, but it's your job to find it. Um, and then other thing but that you should take into account, especially if you want to claim that your quantum algorithm is better than the classical one, is that some uh, particular uh, gate sets like the one formed by the Clifford group, uh, these are classically simulated. So your, your quantum circuit can be efficiently simulated by a classical computer. You need something else. So that's important also because you can define a huge parameterized quantum circuit and at the very end, you don't even need a quantum computer to run that. So you need a quantum computer to run things that cannot be run in a classical computer, unless you want to prove that you can do the same in, with less resources. So another thing is we have to simplify the circuits, as I say at the beginning. So we can start by this uh, super cool two qubit gate, but at the very end, we have to decompose that into control nodes, for instance. And the last thing uh, is the mapping problem. So our uh, quantum circuits in most of the technologies, all qubits are not connected, which means that if we want to entangle this qubit with this one, and there are some in the middle and they are not connected, then we have to use a swap gates and and other transformations to apply this operation, which increase the circuit depth. And we don't want that in these in, in computers. 
So it's this kind of things is something to take into account when you design your quantum circuit. Okay, I will move to applications and any question regarding the general squeezing the lemon? If not, let's move to applications. There are many of them, as you can see. And I will just focus on this first two because I don't have time for combinatorial optimization either, but we can discuss about that at any point during this, uh, these days. So let me start with the variational quantum eigen solver, which is probably one of the most known variational quantum algorithms. Uh, these are some of the resources. There are very nice tutorials about applications. There are tutorials in almost any quantum language. So I encourage you to check them out. And the variational quantum eigen solver, uh, what tries to find is the solution of the electronic structure problem. I will go through it very quickly. Uh, the idea is that uh, we are we have we want to understand and uh, and describe what are the the how move the electrons let's say around the, our molecule and in the born oppenheimer uh, approximation we can decompose the our hamiltonian into the nucleus part and the electronic structure part and the part of interest for chemistry is precisely the electronic structure one because it's the one that will carry out all the properties of our molecule or all the properties that will be important for our our reactions later etc and hopefully we can uh, rec and decompose it into these three parts, which are the kinetic energy of electrons, the interaction term electron nucleon, and the interaction term between electrons. So in the end, the, the, the message here is, we know how to write down this Hamiltonian, that's not a problem. The problem is finding the, the dynamics and the ground state of this Hamiltonian. So how can we study that? Uh, these functions of this of this electronic structure uh, for single electrons are the the orbitals the were known or orbitals and then the combination of these orbitals for the later determinants and that's the, the thing that is difficult to to, un to to understand and to describe so if we move to the second quantization they have they look like this and we can use these uh, occupation numbers like i have this orbital yes and no and these uh, coefficients in front of them are the, the coefficients of this Slater determinant. So this, the big picture of how these functions look like. And that's the thing that eventually we want to generate in our quantum computer. So in the end, it, it looks like this with this creation and annihilation operators. And the first part is the single excitations of, of that means one electron moves to one orbital. The second is the two electrons excitation. So and we technically have more and more. So at some point we truncate because it's, it becomes too much, uh, too complicated or just we don't need that precision. It depends on which kind of things we want to study. But in the end, uh, I'm explaining all of this because this where the couple cluster single double comes from. So couple cluster and single double because I, I, we are taking into account single and double electron excitations in this Hamiltonian. So, okay, this is nice, but uh, how is this related with our quantum circuit? So in the end, we cannot compute the expectation value of, of this uh, Hamiltonian written in this form. What we can do is to map this Hamiltonian into something that we can measure in our quantum computer. And to do that, we use uh, th uh, transformations like the jordan wigner transformation, which map these fermionic operators into the spin operators that we can measure in our quantum computer, into our... Uh, these Pauli strings that I mentioned before. And these are the ones that we can measure in the, in the quantum circuit. So, okay, we have our uh, cost function, which is this Hamiltonian. Now, how can we com com generate the ansatz to generate the, the electronic structure uh, functions that I mentioned before? So we use this UCC as the ansatz. Uh, so we, this unitary operation will be the exponential of this uh, Hamiltonian, and how can we obtain this, uh, this quantum circuit? So the idea is the following. Let me show, okay. So we have these cluster operators, these T operators, which are these parts of the, of the Hamiltonian, the single and the double excitation parts. And uh, we have this creation and annihilation operators that are transformed into a spin operators using, for instance, jordan wigner transformation. And with that, we put all together in these, uh, with these parameters in front of it, which are the variational parameters that uh, we need to compute with our variational algorithm. And the Hartree-Fock approximation, which is like first order approximation, which is the initial state of our quantum circuit. 
So in the end, remember that I mentioned at the very beginning that the exponential of these uh, Pauli matrices are rotational matrices. So in the end, we have a maybe complicated but very clear receipt of how to transform the Hamiltonian of our electronic structure problem into a quantum circuit with this variational parameter that we need to, op to obtain. So it's exactly the same structure, but instead of having this general parameterized quantum circuit, we have this a unitary couple cluster, a single double um, ansatz that is obtained from the electronic structure problem. Okay, so we have our electronic structure problem translating to the spin operators that translate into quantum gates. The problem here is that the, in general, and so the, the number of gates that we require grows pretty fast. So we have a lot of parameters, but on the other side, the, the precision is really high because we are approximating the ground state really. Okay, any question? I know that I went through it very quickly, but I really wanted to go to quantum machine learning before I have to, to close. Any question? Okay, if not, let's move to quantum machine learning finally. So uh, I forgot to put some, some resources here. You can check Penny Lane tutorials. There are many of them. And of course, the references that I will show you later. Um, in the end, quantum machine learning field is as big as, or almost as big as machine learning field in many cases. Uh, we, we are not even, uh, we don't even have the same opinion of what's the definition of quantum machine learning, depending on who are you asking. So that's why I, I use this just to make clear what I understand for, from quantum machine learning. So we have two things here. Is the, your algorithm classical or quantum? Is your data classical or quantum? So depending on that, you have these, uh, these four possibilities. And what I use, uh, what I define as quantum machine learning, but this is a personal opinion, is this part here. So my algorithm is quantum, no matter what, what are the data. Some people or some other um, um, researchers also call quantum machine learning to having quantum data and using a machine learning model that is classical. It's just another definition. But just to be clear of what I'm talking about after in the next slides, uh, the algorithm is always quantum, okay? And as any other machine learning, we have supervised learning, we have unsupervised learning, we have reinforcement learning. In the end, what people are doing is anything that has been proposed for machine learning, let's try to adapt it to quantum. And I will just mention a few examples of supervised learning, okay? But just to let you know that there are technically much more examples on different kinds of algorithms. So how can we move from classical to quantum neural networks? Um, as you know, this is the structure of classical neurons is we have some input, we have some hidden units that process the, the information, and then we have some output. And with that output, we construct a cost function and, uh, and, and try to optimize the parameters of the hidden neurons. Similarly, uh, we can think about di different proposals of, of quantum neural networks. This is not the unique one. This is the circuit-centric like one. And there are all these references and more than, than talk about them. So the idea is similar. We have some encoding part, we have some processing part, and the measurement that we will use to construct the, the cost function. And we have to optimize the parameters in the processing and encoding parts, okay? So the idea, the general picture is exactly the same. So how can we do that? There are many ways to do it, so I will just follow the one that, that we use in our works. But uh, the general structure is, is always the same, is this particular one. So let me, let's think about what will be the minimal quantum neural network to understand how this works. So first, what is the minimal classical neural network? And the answer is a single layer neural network. So there is the, the, uni, the universal approximation theorem that states that providing you have enough neurons, you only need one layer of hidden neurons to approximate any continuous function. Another thing is that maybe you require a huge amount of neurons and that's why we have in the end many layers and we use different techniques. But theoretically, mathematically, you can approximate any function with a, a single layer of, of neurons. So similarly, what is the, the minimal quantum neural network? So what are the minimal resources to approximate any general function? And the answer is a single qubit. So in the end, a single qubit, of course, is something that you can simulate classically. It's just a qubit, it's only one. 
But the idea here is let's try to understand how quantum uh, information is processed in this kind of models to see if we can find any advantage in when we consider more qubits. So we have this processing uh, in neural networks from left to right, let's say from input to the output. And in, in this particular uh, quantum neural network model, the processing will go in this direction. So each, um, each quantum gate will be, it will be the equivalent of the, of the neuron, of the hidden neuron. And we need to introduce the data in all of these parts. Similarly, as we do with neural networks where the data is technically encoded into each of these uh, hidden neurons. So the intuition behind it is uh, if we try to, to just construct a, a neural network with only one unitary operation or even multi-unitary operations, but without introducing the data in all of them, the result will be trivial and it will not be able to classify or do anything with that. So imagine that we have this product here. Remember the block sphere representation that I introduced before? So imagine that we want to perform some classification problem and we always start in the zero state, is the north of the block sphere. And our level is in a particular place of, of this block sphere. Then we can find a very complicated path towards that level or a very direct one, it doesn't matter. Because if we move to a different level, since the, the unitary transformation is exactly the same because the parameters uh, after the training will be the same, we will end up in, in another point, so misclassifying the points. So this is too, too naive, we cannot do anything useful with that. So we need to add some plasticity, some, some, adapt some, uh, some dependency on the parameters as we have in, in, in a standard neural networks in the end. So that's why we use the data rebloating strategy, which in the end is a future map. So we need to find a way to encode the data into our quantum circuit. And a, a way to do that is just repeating the layers of encoding over and over. So the idea is this thing. So we, our path around the block sphere is, depends on the data. So in a general picture with more qubits, the idea will be the same. You cannot draw that in a block sphere representation, but in the end, you have a way to adapt the circuit with the same parameters to go to one place or another of your Hilbert space. The general picture this is just one of the strategies and this data rebloating in the end is one of the, the quantum feature maps that you can apply. There are many more. So in the end, you have some initial state, you encode the data using this quantum feature map that could be the data rebloating or could be another one. And then you rotate to, to measure in the correct basis, obtain, a, obtain some expectation value. And with this expectation value, you can, have, you can compute the kernel as uh, was explaining uh, the Roman Krems uh, this morning, and probably I guess that he will talk about uh, that uh, in more detail in the quantum context, or minimize the fidelity with respect to some target state or any other possible strategy that you can think about that requires optimization, so the optimization of some cost function. So I will just show an example of this last one because it's the one that I'm more familiar with, but you, you can also uh, uh, compute the kernel of of your, uh, of your quantum neural network using the, the same strategy. So let me show you a very simple example, which is the, I mean, the most simple example that you can think about, which is a single qubit classifier. So what, how can we design that? We can have a target, we have first to define target states, let's say the zero and the one state. So that means that we divide the block sphere into two parts. So in general, for multi-class uh, classification, we can define and we can divide the block sphere into more parts if we wish. Next part will be to define the parameterized quantum circuit. So as I said, we define a unitary transformation that will be some rotational gates where there are some parameters that are variational and some parameters that will be the, the, the training points, okay? So for instance, an angle of theta plus our training point. Next step is to define the loss function. In this case, the loss function will be the overlap between our training point and the corresponding label. So if we start with, the zero, uh, with a class zero uh, state, we will compute the overlap between the, our quantum state and the zero state and some overall possible overlaps. So in the end, you have a, a huge loss function that you can optimize classically. And finally, you apply that for a quantum classifier. I mean, it's much clearer, I think, in the, in the tutorial that, that you can check in my GitHub repo. 
But in the end, the idea is that you have some label and you are trying to, uh, to optimize a, a loss function, which is a, a super, uh, superposition of, of different um, training points. And similarly, you can apply exactly the same idea, but instead of, uh, of optimizing with respect to target state, you can try to fit the, the curve of some particular function and learn this function curve. So in this case, by uh, imagine that you measure the expectation value of the of the zeta, zeta operator, and depending on this value, that means the value of this function, and you can optimize that. And as you can see, as we consider more and more layers, the, the solution is more and more precise. And this is related uh, to the main core of why these techniques work and, and, and has sense, and is that this uh, quantum neural network model in the end can, approx can approximate any um, Fourier um, series. So it can be decomposed into Fourier series. And that's why it can approximate any continuous function in the end. So what this uh, tells us, we don't know exactly if, and it's not proven if there will be any quantum advantage here, but at least we know that we can do the same as we can do in classical, uh, with classical neural networks, which is the first step. And uh, there are a lot of benchmarks and people working on seeing if we can obtain the same results, but using less parameters, or we, if we can go further because we require less parameters, what is the role of entanglement in these models, et cetera. So this is a very simple model. It's only a single qubit. It's, it's too simple to explore anything further, but it provides the grounds to study what could come with entanglement and more, and more qubits. Is this more or less clear? Okay, it's only three minutes left, so I will just close it. Okay. If not, we can in any way continue discussing that later. So I have no time to go through the last example, which is the meta variational quantum eigen solver, but the idea is similar. So instead of computing the ground state of if, if needed, we can still like five, huh. ten minutes more because okay. it's like four to four. So if you need ten minutes, coffee wait, a uh, coffee break will wait for us. Okay, okay. <laughs> So I will just mention this last example, and I think it's better if we can take a look to the code. So I encourage you to do that if you are interested on that, and we can discuss about it uh, the next days. But uh, I wanted to show this example because it, this mixes the BQE and the, and the quantum uh, machine learning strategy that I just mentioned before, which is this time what I want to learn is the, um, is the energy curve of a particular Hamiltonian. So in general, in BQE, this is the BQE. So this is the original BQE paper. So they have to perform an individual experiment, computing, optimizing everything, computing all the gradients, et cetera. So it's obviously costly for each of these blue points. And in the end, they were interested in on, on, on this particular region. So where the energy was minimum as a function of this Hamiltonian parameter, which was the interatomic distance. So why we have to spend all this amount of computational time in this uh, atomic separation of 300 picometers if we are only interested in a particular region? The problem is that we don't know where is this region. So the idea of the MetaBQE is precisely that, to learn uh, what is the, uh, the profile to identify these regions that deserve some attention for some reason. So exactly this. So instead of running individual minimizations, we compute we use, uh, uh, we encode the Hamiltonian parameter using this data reblooding strategy into the gates of this, uh, uh, into the gates of, of our parameterized quantum circuit. We construct a big loss function that corresponds not only to the grown expectation value of the Hamiltonian for a particular parameter, but many of them, and minimize this, uh, this big loss function. So in the end, having this, uh, this profile. And after that, we can just um, run the circuit, but with fixed parameters to obtain the energy for other points. And then you, you can scan for different, for different energies. And the good point here is that it can get, uh, use the properties of the quantum neural networks, for instance, that the, there is a correlation between the different parameters of your circuit. So you can avoid the barren plateau problem. So let me conclude uh, all this talk. Uh, I know that I talk about many concepts and sorry about that. <laughs> but the main idea, the main, um, yeah, the main idea that I would like you to, to remember is that we are currently the noise intermediate scale era. And there are a lot of challenges 
uh, both theoretical ones and experimental ones, because we are we don't have perfect quantum computers and they are very small. So what kind of things can we what kind of things can we do? It's the big question in in this near term quantum computing. And of course, we have variational algorithms, but we have any other kinds of algorithms and paradigms and, and, and computational paradigms that we can also use in this next era. And in the meantime, we need to to develop all these software tools that allow us to control the quantum computer and also to develop all these uh, error mitigation techniques, etc., which requires this classical uh, post-processing. We also need benchmark measures. We don't know if the quantum computer is, is better or, or not uh, from the classical techniques, so we need to define these, these benchmarks and, and to compare them. Practical applications, we don't know yet what are these applications. We, we have some hope that quantum chemistry can came up with, with some applications at near term, but we don't know yet. Maybe quantum machine learning, it's not clear. And of course, all the enabling technologies. So we need to define all these quantum optimal control strategies. We need to improve the, uh, the qubits quality, et cetera. So there are, of course, many things to do. No matter what is your background, there is always something that, uh, that will be related with your background in, in quantum computing. Uh, I just want to mention that we have many quantum languages in case that you are not familiar with them. Basically, every company or research group is developing their own language. So, so of course, there is a lot of, of work in, in uh, unifying these languages and using different kinds of simulators. So all these software tools that I mentioned before. And the next goal, it's, uh, it's not clear, but to me will be full tolerant quantum computation. So in the end, we will need to have these quantum error correcting codes that allow us to, to apply any possible quantum algorithm. But in this full tolerant era, we can also apply the variational quantum algorithm, for instance, because in the end, the framework is exactly the same, just that it will be much, much more precise and we don't need to, to perform these uh, error mitigation techniques, maybe, because we can really find what are the angles that works for this particular algorithm. So in the end, whatever we develop in this NISC era will also be useful for the fault tolerant quantum era. And we don't know how much time it will require to arrive there or if it will be possible to scale and have these millions of qubits in, in our chips. But in the meantime, we are learning a lot of physics and, uh, and also developing a lot of computational tools, both classical and quantum, because it's time that there is a quantum advantage experiment. Someone develops a very clever classical technique. So it's a kind of of work that at the same time everybody uh, obtains some benefit from it. So that's all I will talk about and thank you very much for your attention and happy to discuss anything later. So any questions? Can you maybe mention an example where quantum machine learning can outperform a classical neural network? I don't know anything about quantum machine learning, so I don't know even know if there's someone some exists. There is no proof advantage so far. So there oh, okay. are many proposals, uh, as as the one that I presented of quantum neural networks. You also have uh, quantum Boltzmann machines, quantum support vector machines. So in the end, for each classical machine learning model, there is the quantum equivalent. But so far, uh, for many reasons, there are no theoretical reasons yet to prove that there is some quantum advantage. I personally think that entanglement will play some role, role and maybe you can train your quantum neural network in a more efficient way, but there is no theoretical proof of that, it's just intuition. And on the other side, uh, the benchmarks are really difficult because so far we have a small quantum computers. So they can be simulated with classical resources. So whatever you go, you do there, you can simulate that. And in big simulations are not possible either because the classical capabilities are, are limited uh, when you move to 50, 60 qubits. So it's not clear yet. I guess that until we have a real quantum computer of many qubits, we will not really be able to prove uh, uh, advantage unless, of course, someone work on the, um, on the theory side. Uh, some people think that the advantage will come from, from quantum data. So instead of using trying to use quantum machine learning to a classical classification task, like, uh, like the one that I show of circles of different colors and that's it, 
the advantage will come of using uh, the quantum neural network to classify or to or to model quantum data that comes from the experiment. But still, these models to me are not super clear yet. So there is a lot of room for uh, for many things. So okay, just then just to understand this better, would it be theoretically possible to apply this quantum quantum machine learning to classical data in the sense, for example? Uh, thinking about the power of qubits, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind, for example, about compressed sensing, so compressing images, like mm -hmm. storing information into qubits would be much more effective than into classical qubits. So would this be a realistic or meaningful application for that? Just Actually, there are some applications in that direction. So there is uh -huh. the quantum autoencoder, which is like the very the, like the standard autoencoder, but <laughs> quantum. So in the end, you have some, but, but it's a, again the same. It's a variational algorithm that you have to try uh, train uh, classically. So you still need the classical resources there that you encode the information into a small Latent space in your qubits. You perform whatever operation and then you decompress. So I, I think it's also a very nice application. And let's see if it's. Uh, if it can find some advantage. But in the end, if you try to compare it with the classical one, there is no clear advantage yet, unless you've been able to, to prove that. I Again, I think that entanglement will play some role, but mm -hmm. we don't know yet exactly how. So it's just uh, only a hypothesis. And that's why people are you know, proposing models and let's see if someone is able to prove advantage with them. Thank you. Thanks. I wanted to ask about this. Uh, you had this like parallel between like most basic general model, as in like uh, in classical sense, it was this uh, neural network with one hidden layer. Mm -hmm. But there, I can put any ki any size of the input I want and any size of the hidden layer I want. And then I am confused about this parallel of this single qubit thing, right? Because there I have only two parameters on the block sphere. So can you explain a little bit more how is this like equivalently general? So yeah, that's true. And that's why uh, you cannot use this single qubit unless you are introducing some extra complexity like the, the points, like, like the data points. You only have two degrees of freedom in your qubit. But this is just to describe the state of one qubit. So at the very end, if you want to de describe the state, you need two numbers. But which two numbers? That's the big question. How can you obtain these two numbers? So in the end, the parameters are the ones in the quantum uh, in the gates. Actually, you have three in them because you don't. Since this is processing, you still have this relative phase that you can play with. So in the end, uh, if you analytically, you can do that analytically actually which is uh, you start with the zero state, apply some rotational, and then another one and another one and many of them and compute what is the final state. The final state, you can prove that is some super complicated function zero plus some complicated function one. That, that's uh, your final state. And you are trying to find what are the parameters and the, and the dependency in these two parts or in one of them that allows you to to learn any continuous function. So in the end, actually, the, uh, what you are obtaining are, is a Fourier series in form of these two, two parts. Uh, so I, although you need numbers, uh, finding what is the function that represents these two numbers is the is the question that you need to train. Yes. Yeah, so, so so it's just the circuit basically, not the cube. Okay, exactly. Okay, it's yeah, the I circuit understand. itself. So the, the what is going on is going on everything in the circuit parts. That's why you have to reintroduce the data in all of them in, uh, and not only in the beginning, because if not, you can just compress everything into two numbers and that's it. Right, right. Okay, thanks a lot. And then maybe I was thinking if it's okay, I wanted to also contribute to this like previous discussion about a speed up, right? So this is like, this is like completely like uh, completely true and honest answer that we don't have a don't have a provable speed up. But I wanted to mention something in connection to my previous lecture in the morning, because actually readout and initialization are part of the quantum algorithms that are like super costly so even if you don't have a speed up for quantum machine learning maybe you want to have a convolutional neural network that is on chip so you don't have to destroy everything read out run on the computer that is next to your fridge and then reinitialize so even if there is not a speed up i think a lot of people are super like excited about this because then you can have like a whole like 
quantum circuit, some machine learning, like the whole like information processing pipeline, like inside of the bridge on your circuit. And then in itself, I think it's very exciting. So I just wanted to add this, thanks. Thanks for pointing this out that uh, I completely agree. And let me add uh, some examples. So for instance, there was a workshop recently in CERN about the quantum uh, computation perspectives in quantum computation and also quantum sensing. And what experimentalists are thinking there uh, is how can we introduce sensors or, uh, as you said, um, quantum neural network models inside of the detector so we don't have to process all the data over and over. And so uh, the problem in CERN is like you're generating a huge amount of data each time that you, you run the experiment and the collision, and you need to classify these data super quickly to identify what are the the events that are of, inter of some physical interest. And the amount of data is so big that at some point it will not be possible to process that quick enough. So imagine that you have something in chips, something in the detectors that already can classify the data that is uh, going uh, out. And uh, with that, we can, after that, maybe apply a classical technique, but we, already, we are uh, already cleaning the data uh, significantly. Okay, any more questions? Okay, Do quantum kernel methods also suffer from the Baron Plateau problem? Technically, yes. But uh, as I said before, these works that show that you can avoid Baron Plateaus by correlating the parameters of your variational quantum circuit, it depends on what is your uh, quantum future map. Future map. So if you're correlating different parts of your circuit there, then you can maybe avoid the barren plateaus. If not, you will suffer from exactly the same. So it depends, but. It's like you have more freedom to yeah, model the landscape with the kernel. Yeah. I guess that uh, they will talk about them uh, later in this, in this school, so. Okay, ask him. so let's wrap up maybe. Thanks speaker again. Thanks, Alba. Thank you. So just bear with me for, for a minute, please, and then we go for a coffee break. So let's have a coffee break for like half an hour, and then we do the hands-ons first, first session. All the de details.